It was an urge. A strong urge, and the longer I let it go the stronger it got, to where I was taking risks to go out and kill people, risks that normally, according to my little rules of operation, I wouldn't take because they could lead to arrest. Where does this urge come from, and why is it so powerful? If we all experienced this urge, would we be able to resist? Is it genetic, hormonal, biological, or cultural conditioning? Do serial killers have any control over their desires? We all experience rage and inappropriate sexual instincts, yet we have some sort of internal cage that keeps our inner monsters locked up. Call it morality or social programming, these internal blockades have long since been trampled down in the psychopathic killer. Not only have they let loose the monster within, they are virtual slaves to its beastly appetites. What do you think sets them apart? Serial killers have tested out a number of excuses for their own behavior. Henry Lee Lucas blamed his upbringing. Others like Jeffrey Dahmer say that they were born with a part of them missing. Ted Bundy claimed pornography made him do it. Herbert Mullen blamed the voices in his head that told him it was time to sing the dying song. The ruthless Carl Panzram swore that prison turned him into a monster, while Bobby Joe Long said a motorcycle accident made him hypersexual and eventually a serial lust killer. The most psychopathic, like John Wayne Gacy, turned the blame around and boasted that the victims deserve to die. They must be insane. What normal person could slaughter another human for the sheer pleasure of it? Yet the most chilling fact about serial killers is that they are rational and calculating. As the British Jeffrey Dahmer, Dennis Nilsson put it, a mind can be evil without being abnormal. Before we look at who they are, we must first describe what they are. The FBI defines serial murder as the unlawful killing of two or more victims by the same offender in separate events. This was a quote from the FBI.gov website. The killer is usually a stranger to the victim, and the murders appear unconnected or random. The murders reflect a need to sadistically dominate the victim. The murder is rarely for profit. The motive is psychological, not material. The victim may have symbolic value for the killer, and the method of killing may reveal this meaning. Killers often choose victims who are vulnerable like prostitutes, homeless people and runaways. Statistically, the average American serial killer is a white male from a lower to middle class background, usually in his 20s or 30s. But this is mainly because in the United States, 76.9% of the population is white. Many were physically or emotionally abused by parents, and some were adopted. As children, fledgling serial killers often set fires, torture animals, and wet their beds. These red flag behaviors are known as the McDonald triad. Brain injuries are common. Some are very intelligent and have shown great promise as successful professionals. They are also fascinated with the police and authority in general. They have either attempted to become police themselves but were rejected, worked as security guards, or served in the military. Many, including John Wayne Gacy, the Hillside Stranglers, and Ted Bundy, have disguised themselves as law enforcement officials to gain access to their victims. Serial killers choose victims weaker than themselves. Often their victims will fit a certain stereotype, which has symbolic meaning for the killer. Bundy brutally murdered college-age women with long brown hair. Was he killing over and over again the upper-class fiancé who broke off her engagement with him? David Berkowitz, aka Son of Sam was not so particular. He hated all women. I blame them for everything. Everything evil that has happened in the world somehow goes back to them. Gacy savagely strangled young men, some of them his own employees, calling them worthless little queers and punks. Some believe that Gacy homicidal rage was projected onto the boys who represented his own inadequacy in the eyes of his own domineering father. With rare exception, serial killers objectify and humiliate their victims. Bundy deliberately kept the conversation brief, if he got to know the victim and saw her as a real person, it would destroy the fantasy. Serial killers are sadists, seeking perverse pleasure in torturing the victim, even resuscitating them at the brink of death, so they can torture them some more. How's it feel, knowing you're going to die? Gacy asked his victims as he strangled them, even reciting the 23rd Psalm, urging them to be brave in the face of death. They need to dominate, control, and own the person. Yet when the victim dies, they are abandoned again, left alone with their unfathomable rage and self-hatred. This hellish cycle continues until they are caught or killed. We think we can spot lunacy, that a maniac with uncontrollable urges to kill will be unable to contain himself. 
On the bus, in the street, it is the mentally ill we avoid, sidestepping the disheveled, unshaven man who rants on over some private outrage. Yet if you intend to avoid the path of a serial killer, your best strategy is to sidestep the charming, the impeccably dressed and polite individual. They blend in, camouflaged in contemporary anonymity. They lurk in churches, malls, and prowl the freeways and streets. Dress him in a suit and he looks like 10 other men, said one attorney in describing Dahmer. Like all evolved predators, they know how to stalk their victims by gaining their trust. Serial killers don't wear their hearts on their sleeves. Instead, they hide behind a carefully constructed facade of normalcy. Because of their psychopathic nature, serial killers do not know how to feel sympathy for others or even how to have a relationship. Instead, they learn to simulate it by observing others. It is all a manipulative act designed to entice people into their trap. Serial killers are actors with a natural penchant for performance. Henry Lee Lucas described being a serial killer as being like a movie star. You're just playing the part. The macabre Gacy loved to dress up as a clown, while the Zodiac suited up in a bizarre executioner's costume that looked like something out of Alice in Wonderland. In court, Bundy told the judge, I'm disguised as an attorney today. Bundy had previously disguised himself as a compassionate rape crisis center counselor or a suicide crisis hotline operator. The most coveted role of roaming psychopaths is a position of authority. Gacy was an active, outgoing figure in business and society, became a member of the JCs. Many joined the military, including Berkowitz who was intensely patriotic for a time. Playing a police officer however, is the most predictable. Carrying badges and driving cop-like vehicles not only feeds their need to feel important, it allows them access to victims who would otherwise trust their instincts and not talk to strangers. Yet, when they are caught, the serial killer will suddenly assume a mask of insanity, pretending to be multiple personalities, schizophrenic, or prone to blackouts. Anything to evade responsibility. Even when they pretend to truly reveal themselves, they are still locked into playing a role. What nameless dread lies behind the psychopath's mask? What's one less person on the face of the earth anyway? Ted Bundy's chilling rationalization demonstrates how serial killers truly think. Bundy could never understand why people couldn't accept the fact that he killed because he wanted to kill. Just as these killers rip open their victims to see how they run, as Ed Kemper put it, forensic psychiatrists and FBI agents have tried to get inside the killer's mind. Traditional explanations include childhood abuse, genetics, chemical imbalances, brain injuries, exposure to traumatic events, and perceived societal injustices. The frightening implication is that a huge population has been exposed to one or more of these traumas. Is there some sort of lethal concoction that sets serial killers apart from the rest of the population? We believe that we have control over our impulses. No matter how angry we get, there is something that stops us from taking our aggressions out on others. Do serial killers lack a moral safety latch? Or are they being controlled by something unfathomable? I wished I could stop, but I could not. I had no other thriller happiness, said Dennis Nilsson, who wondered if he was truly evil. Serial killers are undeniably sick, and their numbers seem to be growing like an epidemic. I know it doesn't seem that way, because most of the documentaries you watch are about serial killers of the 70s and 80s, but just so you know, there are between 30 and 50 serial killers in the United States at any given moment. But that's not really a lot, considering that serial killers kill 150 people each year, and that's less than 1% of the annual murders in the United States. The same number of people are killed by falling coconuts each year. Is it our modern times that creates them, or have they been in operation before we classified them as a phenomenon? Although the term serial killer was coined in 1971, early fables of human monsters reveal that there has always been danger in straying too far, or in accepting the help of strangers. The carnivorous characters in Grimm's fairy tales become vivid metaphors of human bloodlust. Gruesome stories of bluebeards and their bloody chambers, big bad wolves, trolls under the bridge and witches in the forest, all of whom make meals out of unsuspecting innocence, remind us of our contemporary monsters. These cautionary tales may represent an early pre-psychological way of understanding the sadistic side of human nature. Lycanthropy, a combination of the Greek words wolf and man, was another early concept created to describe the horror of senseless sexual murder. In the A to Z Encyclopedia of Serial Killers, Harold Schechter and David Everett described the lycanthropic madman as sexual predators who terrorized 16th century peasant villages so much that the authorities regarded it as one of the most pressing social problems of the day. 
Among the most notorious of these medieval wolfmen was Gilles Garnier of France and the German Peter Stubb, both of whom attacked children, ripping them apart and cannibalizing them. Stubb even went so far as to savagely mutilate his own son, gnawing at his brain. The wolfman myth is still popular today. We still hear how a full moon brings out the crazies. Albert Fish, the notorious cannibal killer of children, was called the werewolf of wisteria and enjoyed dancing naked in the full moon. Other lunar lunatics include Ed Gain, who also frolicking in the moonlight, dressed in his mother suit made from the skin of dead women. Unlike Gain, Bobby Joe Long did not appreciate being adorned in female body parts. At puberty, he had his abnormally enlarged breasts surgically removed. Even after the operation, Long claimed to be affected by the moon cycles through his own bizarre menstrual cycle. The 19th century gave rise to another chilling predecessor to the serial killer's persona, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Robert Louis Stevenson created a literary man-monster who embodied the divided self, appearing civilized and rational on the outside, while inside a wretched brute struggled to break loose. One of the most intriguing peculiarities of serial killers is their benign Dr. Jekyll appearance. They look and behave like every man or any man, abnormally normal. If they come across as potentially dangerous in any way, they will neutralize it in their behavior. The imposing 6'9", Edmund Kemper, cultivated a gentle giant routine, which helped him to lure female hitchhikers into his car. The charming Ted Bundy wore a cast, looking meekly pathetic, and asked for help. The young women who gave him a hand must have thought of it as a random act of kindness. What resulted was a senseless act of murder. The notorious Gacy entertained hospitalized children in his Pogo the Clown costume. You know? Clowns get away with murder. Gacy once said. He used rope tricks from his performance to strangle unsuspecting young men, who thought the worst they would have to endure would be some hokey entertainment. With many serial killers, the hidden hide comes out only after the victim is lulled into complacency. As a man obsessed with recreating a human being from dead body parts, Mary Shelley's Dr. Frankenstein was seeking the same ultimate power of creation as God himself. While the movie character attempted to compose a man, our modern-day Dr. Frankensteins are more gifted in the decomposing arts. Jeffrey Dahmer and Dennis Nilsson both tried to create companionship in corpses. Dahmer operated on his victims, hoping for his own love zombie who would never stray. In his own attempts to create the perfect companion, Nelson said, I think that in some cases I killed these men in order to create the best image of them. It was not really a bad but a perfect and peaceful state for them to be in, as if he were doing them a favor. I remember being thrilled that I had full control and ownership of this beautiful body. Many believe that Ed Gain was attempting to reconstruct his mother by stealing body parts from a nearby cemetery. And of course, one of the most popular monster monikers for serial killers is vampire. In gothic drama, vampires represented the repressed sexuality of straightless Victorian society, creatures of the night driven by beastly desires. The vampire motif is so frequent that we see localized vampires. The vampire of Dusseldorf Peter Curtin, the vampire of Hanover, Fritz Harman, or the vampire of Sacramento Richard Chase. Curtin claimed that his chief satisfaction in killing was to catch the blood spurting from a victim's wounds in his mouth and swallow it. Another deeply demented vampire killer, John Hay, claimed that disturbing dreams created his unquenchable thirst for human blood. I saw before me a forest of crucifixes, which gradually turned into trees. Suddenly the whole forest began to writhe in the trees, stark and erect, to ooze blood. A man went to each tree catching the blood. Drink, he said. The curious phenomenon of the murder of strangers is extremely rare in so-called primitive societies, and that it is primarily in modern, industrializing societies, the stranger murder becomes a major homicidal theme. We can only speculate. However, it can be said that the major archetype of the serial sex slayer emerged in the grimy gas-lit streets of industrialized 19th-century London. Jack the Ripper's infamous Whitechapel murders baffled the police and terrorized London. As the first sensationalized serial killer, the Ripper became the prototype of the lust murderer. The mystery of his identity paralleled the mystery of his motive. Nothing like this was seen before. Why would anyone go lurking in the dead of night eviscerating poverty-stricken prostitutes? Clearly, the Ripper was insane. They explored the insane asylums, looking for a raving, woman-hating madman. Crazed immigrants, lunatic butchers, and even syphilis-ridden royalty were suspect. Most believed Jack the Ripper had to be an immigrant. Americans were a favorite suspicion because no Englishman would commit such horrid crimes. 
The Ripper's blade work had some speculating he was a deranged doctor. In any case, as the insane asylums were searched and suspicious whispers echoed in respectable bourgeois homes, it became clear that the Ripper could be anyone. The uncivilized monster behind Victorian society's prim veneer had acted out in the ugliest of deeds. In the 19th century, civilization stopped looking to the devil as the sole force behind violent sadistic behavior. Instead, scientists and writers began searching for the beast within. Darwin's theories on evolution bridged the gap between beasts and man. How far are we from our grunting rock-throwing ape-like ancestors? Not very far at all, according to 19th-century criminologists Cesare Lombroso and Max Nordau, who believed that violent men had primitive faces with heavy jaws and low foreheads. By measuring the foreheads of Italian criminals, Lombroso believed he could target violent criminals. Although Lombroso and his measuring tape have long since been discredited, the concept of a lingering animalistic brutality is still popular today. As we move forward, becoming more technologically advanced, there is something that refuses to budge, some primitive holdout of the darkest recesses of our psyche. Is it the caveman within, as some contemporary paleopsychologists say, the vestigial beast that got us through the survival of the fittest when we needed it, but now that we live in a civilized society, it is no longer needed. Franz Joseph Gall promoted phrenology. By feeling the bumps on a person's head, Gall believed that he could predict their character and level of intelligence. Physiognomy, developed by Johann Caspar Lavater, claimed to read a person's character in their facial features. These theories were all the rage when Herman Mudgett, aka H. H. Holmes, stood trial for running a deadly boarding house that put the Bates Motel to shame. In Depraved, Harold Schechter describes how the public, eager to know why Holmes was such a fiend, flocked to see maps of the killer's head shape, as if a certain pattern in the bumps of his skull would spell out murderer. Holmes himself described his own evil metamorphosis. My features are assuming a pronounced satanical cast. My head and face are gradually assuming an elongated shape. I believe fully that I am growing to resemble the devil, that the similitude is almost completed. In fact, so impressed am I with this belief, that I am convinced that I no longer have anything human in me. The devil made me do it routine was a transparent attempt to avoid the hangman's noose. This particular devil was eventually hanged for his misdeeds. I have several children who I'm turning into killers. Wait till they grow up. This was the message scrawled on David Berkowitz's apartment wall, with an arrow pointing to a hole in the wall. Are some children just born bad? Some serial killers are precociously demented, fascinated by sadistic violence at a very early age. As a child, Ed Kemper was already beheading his sister's dolls, playing execution games, and once told his sister that he wanted to kiss his second grade teacher, also mentioning this. If I kiss her, I would have to kill her first. One of the first places our society looks to for an explanation is the serial killer's upbringing. So many of us wanted to believe that something had traumatized little Jeffrey Dahmer, otherwise we must believe that some people simply give birth to monsters. In some cases, the abuse of children by their parents is barbaric, and it seems a little wonder that anything but a fledgling serial killer would come from such horrible squalor. As a child, the Boston Strangler, Albert de Salvo, was actually sold off as a slave by his alcoholic dad. Many sadistic murderers portray their childhood as an endless chain of horrifying sexual abuse, torture, and mayhem. Some stories of torture may be exaggerated for sympathy because it is always to the killer's advantage to concoct wicked parents as an excuse, but some have been corroborated by witnesses. Even families that appear healthy on the outside might be putting on an act. Children can learn the Jekyll and Hyde routine from parents who are outgoing and social with neighbors and co-workers, but who scowl at their kids' inadequacies when they get home. As we examine childhood abuse as a possible key to the serial killer's behavior, we must remember that many children have suffered horrible abuse at the hands of their parents, but did not grow up to be lust murderers. Childhood abuse is not a direct link to a future in crime. And while many people are victimized as children, very few grow up to be sadistically violent toward strangers. Childhood abuse may not be the sole excuse for serial killers, but it is an undeniable factor in many of their backgrounds. Parents who abuse their children, physically as well as psychologically, instill in them an almost instinctive reliance upon violence as a first resort to any challenge. Childhood abuse not only spawns violent reactions, but also affects the child's health, including brain injuries, malnutrition, and other developmental disorders. 
Some parents believed that by being harsh disciplinarians, it would toughen the child. Instead, it often creates a lack of love between parent and child that can have disastrous results. If the child doesn't bond with its primary caretakers, there is no foundation for trusting others later in life. This can lead to isolation, where intense violent fantasies become the primary source of gratification. Instead of developing positive traits of trust, security, and autonomy, child development becomes dependent on fantasy life and its dominant themes, rather than on social interaction. When the child grows up, all they know are their fantasies of domination and control. They have not developed compassion for others. Instead, humans become flattened out symbols for them to enact their violent fantasies. In looking at the parents for explanations, we see both horrifying mothers and fathers. The blame usually falls on the mother, who has been described as too domineering or too distant, too sexually active or too repressed. Perhaps the mother is blamed more because the father has often disappeared, therefore unaccountable. When the father is implicated, it is usually for sadistic disciplinarian tactics, alcoholic rants, and overt anger toward women. It all seems to begin or end with the mother. Henry Lee Lucas launched his murderous career by killing his mom. Ed Kemper ended his, also by killing his mother. Even the Shakespearean multiple murderer Hamlet had an unnatural obsession with his mother's sexuality. Serial murderers are frequently found to have unusual or unnatural relationships with their mothers. In our culture, the imposing image of mother looms large in our collective psyches, and some writers easily accept that these killers are lashing out at maternal tyranny. If these murderers are still dominated by mother, then it is easy to dismiss them as mama's boys who never fully matured. Perhaps we find comfort in this cliché. The mother is a reanimate excuse, particularly in our contemporary era of obsessive parenting. In an effort to keep their children chaste, some mothers have linked sexuality with death. Ed Gaines religiously fanatical notorious mother convinced her son that women were vessels of sin and caused disease. In some sort of twisted misinterpretation, Gain made literal vessels out of women, using their skulls for bowls and other domestic objects. Ed's body may have escaped from sexual disease, but his mind was clearly contaminated. Ed Kemper once said, I certainly wanted for my mother a nice quiet easy death as everyone else wants. His idea of an easy death is markedly unusual. After beheading his mom, he shoved her vocal cords down the garbage disposal, raked her headless body, and by some accounts, placed her head on the living room mantle and used it as a dartboard. Admittedly, Kemper's mom was a shrill, tyrannical nag who locked her young son in the basement when he grew too large and frightened his sisters. As an adult, Kemper and his mother fought constantly. Yet, he chose to live with her. Why not just move away? And don't take her calls. Kenneth Bianchi's adoptive mother was pathologically overprotective. When Ken wet his pants, she took him to the doctor to have his genitals examined. Bianchi's mother was deeply disturbed, socially ambitious, dissatisfied, unsure, opinionated and overly protective. She had smothered her adopted son in medical attention and maternal concern from the moment of the adoption. As a child, Bianchi was very dependent on his mother, yet harbored a deadly hostility beneath the surface. Some serial killers had their sexually uninhibited mothers to blame. These mothers overstepped the boundaries, exposing their children to inappropriate sexual behavior. Bobby Joe Long killed women who he said, reminded him of his own mom. She had frequent sex with men in the same room where Bobby slept. According to Long, he shared his bed with his mother until he was 13 years old. This can be true, but can also be another trick he used to get sympathy and use the mother as an excuse for his heinous crimes. Charles Manson's prostitute mother, Kathy Maddox, indifferently declared his name as no-name Maddox for his birth certificate. She hoisted him off on relatives, and in one story, famous but probably untrue, she traded the infant Charlie for a pitcher of beer. When he was sent to live with his aunt, his uncle told him he was a sissy and punished him by sending him to school dressed as a girl. Henry Lee Lucas also suffered gender confusion as a child, courtesy of his mother's sadism. She was a heavy drinker and bootlegger. For unknown reasons she dressed him as a girl until he was seven. I lived as a girl. I was dressed as a girl. I had long hair as a girl. I wore girl's clothes. She senselessly beat him after he had his hair cut because his teacher complained. At one point, his mom struck him on the back of the head with a wooden beam, fracturing his skull. Lucas was also apparently exposed to his mother's sexual activities. He killed his mother in 1951. 
Not all serial killers blamed their mother. In some cases, the father was the abuser, and the psychological abuse is a little different when you add physical abuse coming from a grown man to the picture. John Wayne Gacy's dad berated his son, calling him a sissy, queer, and a failure. A violent alcoholic Gacy father beat his mother and shot his son's beloved dog to punish young John. When Gacy later strangled his young victims, he encouraged them to stay brave while facing death. Through this ritual, Gacy sought to reassert his own vision of a masculine identity that had been squashed down by his father. Albert DeSalvo's father would bring home prostitutes and brutally beat his mother, breaking her fingers one by one, as young Albert helplessly watched. The elder DeSalvo sold his children off as slaves to a farmer in Maine, while his mother went frantically searching for them for six months. The story has been confirmed by family friends and social workers. Pa was a plumber, he smashed me once across the back with a pipe. I didn't move fast enough, said DeSalvo. Not all serial killers were beaten or abused as children. Jeffrey Dahmer had an apparently normal upbringing, yet grew up to be one of the most notorious sex murderers in popular culture. In his book, A Father's Story, Lionel Dahmer searches for answers to his own son's deviance. Lionel, who describes himself as an analytical thinker, believes that Jeffrey's mother's hysteria and psychosomatic illnesses during pregnancy might be responsible. He describes Joyce as going through a difficult pregnancy, constantly vomiting, as if her body was being sickened by what was germinating, an early biological rejection by mother. While pregnant with Jeff, Joyce developed strange fits of rigidity. At times, her legs would lock tightly in place, and her whole body would grow rigid and begin to tremble. Her jaw would jerk to the right and take on a similarly frightening rigidity. During these strange seizures, her eyes would bulge like a frightened animal, and she would begin to salivate, literally frothing at the mouth. As Lionel describes it, it's as if a corpse was giving birth. Father Lionel remains detached and analytical, while Mother Joyce is in the midst of a biological warfare, fighting hormones with drugs. Lionel asks, ominously, why was she so upset all the time? What was it that she found so dreadful? Then, at the end of the long trial, my son was born. Lionel's first sight of his son is in a plastic container, which is how the victims of apartment 213 will later be removed. The bloody chamber of Jeff's apartment, according to Lionel, had its origins in Joyce's drugged womb. While Lionel implicates Joyce as the biological contaminant in Jeffrey's sickness, he admits to his own destructive inclinations, which may have been passed on to their son. Lionel was fascinated by fire and made bombs as a child. A dark pathway had been dug into my brain, he writes. Little Jeffrey is transfixed by a pile of bones, which only seems macabre after the adult Jeffrey's deadly deeds. At the time, Lionel saw it as a normal curiosity. At the age of four, Jeffrey had a double hernia and had to have surgery. So much pain, I learned later that he had asked Joyce if the doctors had cut off his penis. Lionel thinks that this quasi-castrating surgery affected his son. In Jeff, this flattening began to take on a sense of something permanent he wrote. This strange and subtle inner darkening began to appear almost physically. His hair, which had once been so light, grew steadily darker, along with the deeper shading of his eyes. More than anything, he seemed to grow more inward, sitting quietly for long periods, hardly stirring and his face oddly motionless. Both father and son found solace in controlling biological experiments. In the lab, I found a wonderful comfort and assurance in knowing the properties of things, how they could be manipulated in predictable patterns. It provided great relief from the chaos I found at home. Jeff became shy and fearful of others, just as his dad had been. It was as if some element of my character yearned for complete predictability, for rigid structure, said Lionel. I simply didn't know how things worked with other people. Lionel recognized that Jeffrey was so intimidated by their presence that in order for him to have contact with them, they needed to be dead. Lionel sees a terrible vacancy in his own son's eyes and wonders, am I like that? and sees his son as a deeper, darker shadow of himself. He remembers that at the age of 13, he wanted to hypnotize and cast a spell over a girl so he could control her entirely. At what point does an innocent fantasy warp into a deadly fascination? Can we control the inner life of our children? Lionel warns that some of us are doomed to pass a curse instead. The frightening conclusion of Lionel Dahmer's cautionary tale is that we can be blind to our own destructive tendencies and may innocently pass them on. Fatherhood remains, at last, a grave enigma, and when I contemplate that my other son may one day be a father, I can only say to him, as I must to every father after me, take care.
Adoption as a potential contribution to the serial killer's motivation is fascinating because it creates two questions. The first one is that the biological parents may have left their child with deviant genes. We will look into the genetics of serial killers shortly. Finding out that one was adopted may also undermine the sense of identity in a fragile youth and make the child prone to fantasizing an identity of his true parents, either good or bad. Was the mother a prostitute? A nun? Was the father a gangster? A hero? And why did they reject their child? This sense of rejection could have profound consequences on an already unstable psyche. If the child actually meets his biological parent and is again rejected, the damage is worse. David Berkowitz was deeply hurt when his biological mom brushed him off. Some have speculated that Berkowitz's son of Sam was a fantasy attempt to reclaim a parent-child identity that had been crushed in real life. According to Bundy biographers Micho and Ainsworth, Ted's emotional growth were stopped in its tracks after he learned that he was illegitimate at age 13. It was like I hit a brick wall, Bundy had said. Of course, he tried out every excuse he could rummage, so it's difficult to take his word on this when his family life appeared otherwise healthy. It goes without saying that adoption does not create serial killers. At worst, it may dislodge a child's self-identity. But that does not mean that finding oneself in multiple murder is the only option available to adopted children. Some lust murderers claim that exposure to violent events ignited their thirst for blood. Ed Gain, among others, said that seeing farm animals slaughtered gave him perverted ideas. Both Albert Fish and Andre Chikatilo blamed their sadistic bloodlust on frightening childhood stories. Even truly traumatic experiences don't automatically create a serial killer. Acid bath murderer John Hay, as a child, ran outside after a World War II bombing at his London home. The bomb came with a horrifying shriek, and as he staggered up, bruised and bewildered, a head rolled against his foot. Joel Peter Witten, a well-known artist whose work is admittedly gruesome but fascinating, experienced the same event after witnessing a car accident. So what makes one person become a serial killer and another a famous artist? Reform school in the early 20th century did anything but reform. The stories of sadistic guards and medieval punishments are almost paralleled by the violent behavior of the prisoners who went on to serial killing. Fortunately, this sort of extreme discipline is no longer openly tolerated. Although 1920s killer Karl Panzram was an incorrigible juvenile delinquent, the brutal torture he received in reform school aggregated his violent rage. From the treatment I received while there and the lessons I learned from it, I had fully decided when I left there just how I would live my life. I made up my mind that I would rob, burn, destroy and kill everywhere I went and everybody I could for as long as I lived. That's the way I was reformed. Henry Lee Lucas also claimed that prison transformed him into a serial killer. Manson said that he was raped and beaten by other prisoners when he was 14, while a particularly sadistic guard would masturbate as he watched. The grandfatherly pervert Albert Fish blamed his sadomasochistic impulses on his experiences at a Washington, D.C. orphanage. I saw so many boys whipped, it took root in my head. For different reasons, many multiple murderers are isolated as children. Henry Lee Lucas, who was already a shy child, was ridiculed because of his artificial eye, he later said that this mass rejection caused him to hate everyone. Kenneth Bianchi was also a child loner with many problems. One clinical report said that the boy drips urine in his pants, doesn't make friends very easily, and has twitches. The other children make fun of him. Dahmer was antisocial as a kid, laughing when he saw a fellow classmate injured. He later became an alcoholic teenager, routinely ignored by his peers. As the isolation grows more severe, the reliance on fantasies, especially destructive ones, can grow. These fantasies of violence often reveal themselves through two of the three triads of predicting criminal behavior, fire starting, and animal cruelty. These secret compulsions are seen as the seeds to greater mayhem. Violent acts are reinforced since the murderers either are able to express rage without experiencing negative consequences or are impervious to any prohibitions against these actions. Second, impulsive and erratic behavior discourages friendships, increasing isolation. Furthermore, there is no challenge to the offender's beliefs that they are entitled to act the way they do. All learning has a feedback system. Torturing animals and setting fires will eventually escalate to crimes against fellow human beings if the pattern is not somehow broken. So, if you don't have a friend that can smack you over the ear and say, dude, why would you do a thing like that? 
you rely on your self-feedback, and the mistakes will keep rolling down the slope in a snowball effect. Torturing animals is a disturbing red flag. Animals are often seen as practice for killing humans. Ed Kemper buried the family cat alive, dug it up, and cut off its head. Dahmer was notorious for his animal cruelty, cutting off dogs' heads and placing them on sticks behind his house. Yet not all serial killers take their aggressions out on pets. Dennis Nilsson loved animals, particularly his dog, Bleep, whom he couldn't bear to face after being arrested, for fear that it would traumatize the dog. Rapist torturer and murderer, Christopher Wilder, had made donations to save the whales in the Seal Rescue Fund. Peter Curtin loved to watch houses burn, and Berkowitz, when he became tired of torturing his mother's parakeet, became a prolific pyromaniac, keeping a record of his 1,411 fires. Pyromania is often a sexually stimulating activity for these killers. The dramatic destruction of property feeds the same perverse need to destroy another human. Because serial killers don't see other humans as more than objects, the leap between setting fires and killing people is really easy to make. Bedwetting is the most intimate of these triad symptoms and is less likely to be willfully divulged. By some estimates, 60% of multiple murderers wet their beds past adolescence. Kenneth Bianchi apparently spent many nights marinating in urine-soaked sheets. Formative years may play a role in the molding of a serial killer, but they cannot be the sole reason in every case. Many killers blame their families for their behavior, seeking sympathy. In true psychopathic fashion, serial killers are blaming someone for their actions. If their bad childhood is the primary reason for their homicidal tendencies, then why don't their siblings also become serial killers? And if these conditions truly created them, serial killers would probably be unionized by now. There would be so many of them. We must look at other components to see what pushes a serial killer over the edge. I'm the most cold-blooded son of a bitch you'll ever meet. I just like to kill. I wanted to kill. Said Ted Bundy. The hallmark of the psychopath is the inability to recognize others as worthy of compassion. Victims are dehumanized, flattened into worthless objects in the murderer's mind. John Wayne Gacy, never showing an ounce of remorse, called his victims worthless little queers and punks, while the Yorkshire Ripper Peter Sutcliffe arrogantly declared that he was cleaning up the streets of the human trash. In the 19th century, psychopathology was considered to be moral insanity. Today it is commonly known as antisocial personality disorder or sociopathology. Current experts believe that sociopaths are an unfortunate fusion of interpersonal, biological and sociocultural disasters. Psychopaths and sociopaths are diagnosed by their purposeless and invalid antisocial behavior, lack of conscience, and emotional vacuity. They are thrill-seekers literally fearless. Punishment rarely works because they are impulsive by nature and fearless of the consequences. Incapable of having meaningful relationships, they view others as fodder for manipulation and exploitation. According to one psychological surveying tool, between 3 to 5% of men and less than 1% of the female population are sociopaths. Psychopaths often make successful businessmen or world leaders. Not all psychopaths are motivated to kill. But when it is easy to devalue others, and you have had a lifetime of perceived injustices and rejection, murder might seem like a natural choice. The following are environmental factors which create a sociopath. Studies show that 60% of psychopathic individuals had lost a parent. The child is deprived of love or nurturing, and in some cases, parents are detached or absent. If the father is strict and mother is soft, the child learns to hate authority and manipulate the soft parent. Hypocritical parents who privately belittle the child while publicly presenting the image of a happy family. Tests are showing that the nervous system of the psychopath is markedly different. They feel less fear and anxiety than normal people. One carefully conducted experiment revealed that low arousal levels not only causes impulsiveness and thrill-seeking, but also showed how dense sociopaths are when it comes to changing their behavior. A group of sociopaths and a group of healthy individuals were given a task, which was to learn what lever, out of four, turned on a green light. One lever gave the subject an electric shock. Both groups made the same number of errors, but the healthy group quickly learned to avoid the punishing electric shock, while sociopaths took much longer to do so. This need for higher levels of stimulation makes the psychopath seek dangerous situations. When Gacy heard an ambulance, he would follow to see what sort of exciting catastrophe was in the making. Part of the reason for many serial killers seeking to become cops is probably due to the intensity of the job. 
Genetics and physiological factors also contribute to the building of a psychopath. One study in Copenhagen focused on a group of sociopaths who had been adopted as infants. The biological relatives of sociopaths were four to five times more likely to be sociopathic than the average person. Yet, genetics don't tell the whole story, it only shows a predisposition to antisocial behavior. The environment can make or break the psychopathic personality. When a psychopath does inherit genetically based developmental disabilities, it is usually a stunted development of the higher functions of the brain. 30 to 38 percent of psychopaths show abnormal brain wave patterns or EEGs. Infants and children typically have slower brain wave activity, but it increases as they grow up. Not with psychopaths. Eventually, the brain might mature as the psychopath ages. This may be why most serial killers are under 50. The abnormal brain wave activity comes from the temporal lobes and the limbic system of the brain, the areas that control memory and emotions. When the development of this part of the brain is genetically impaired, and the parents of the child are abusive, irresponsible or manipulative, the stage is set for disaster. Can psychopaths be successfully treated? According to the psychiatrists, no. Shock treatment doesn't work, drugs have not proven successful in treatment, and psychotherapy, which involves trust and a relationship with the therapist, is out of the question, because psychopaths are incapable of opening up to others. They don't want to change. The psychopath is only capable of sadomasochistic relationships based on power, not attachment. Psychopaths identify with the aggressive role model, such as an abusive parent, and attack the weaker, more vulnerable self by projecting it onto others. In early childhood development, there is a split in the infant psychopath. The soft me, which is the vulnerable inside, and the hard not me, which is the intrusive punishing outside, represented by neglectful or painful experiences. The infant comes to expect that all outside experiences will be painful, and so he turns inward. In an attempt to protect himself from a harsh environment, the infant develops a character armor, distrusting everything outside, and refusing to allow anything in. The child refuses to identify with parents, and instead sees the parent as a malevolent stranger. Soon, the child has no empathy for anyone. The wall has been built to last. In normal development, the child bonds with the mother for nurturing and love. But for the psychopath, the mother is experienced as an aggressive predator or passive stranger. In the case of violent psychopaths, including serial killers, the child bonds through sadomasochism or aggression. This individual perversely and aggressively does to others as a predator what someone might have done to him in the past. When psychopaths are stalking a victim, they don't consciously feel anger, but the violence shows the dissociated effect. Many killers seem to go into a trance during their predatory and killing phases. The psychopath seeks idealized victims in order to shame, humiliate, and destroy them. By degrading the victim, the psychopath is attempting to destroy the hostile enemy within his own mind. The victim is seen as a symbolic object. Psychopaths know society's rights and wrongs and will behave as if they sincerely believe in these values. There are individuals who are so psychopathically disturbed that no attempt should probably be made to treat them. They are great manipulators and you cannot know for sure if the treatment is working or they are playing you. Many psychopaths will read psychology books and become skilled at imitating other more sympathetic mental illnesses, such as schizophrenia. They will use any means possible to manipulate their evaluators. Do psychopaths ever legitimately hear voices in their heads? It is believed that most functionally psychotic individuals do not experience command hallucinations, and those who do, generally successfully resist them. Perhaps the most dramatic duping of the doctors was Ed Kemper's evaluation. Two psychiatrists interviewed him and agreed that he was now safe. All the while, Kemper had the head of one of his victims sitting in the trunk of his car, parked outside the doctor's office. Bundy charmed his way into the good graces of his jailers, only to escape when they became laxer. Twice. The second time he killed two more girls, courtesy to dormant police officers. Some believe that sexual domination is an expression of the need for power. Sex is only an instrument used by the killer to obtain power and domination over his victim. According to Bundy, sex was not the principal source of gratification. I want to master life and death. Possessing them physically as one would possess a potted plant, a painting, or a Porsche. Others believe that a deviant sexual drive is the cause, and power is the tool to achieve sexual satisfaction. 
Some serial killers will identify with perceived sources of power in an attempt to siphon off some of the feeling of control and omnipotence for themselves. Some will indulge in illusions of religious grandeur, be it Christ or Satan. Others look to the police and will mimic them as if their borrowed authority gives the killer the authority to kill others. One of the most chilling power role models, however, is Hitler. As a teenager, British Patrick McKay was grimly predicted to become a cold, psychopathic killer by one of his doctors. McKay identified with Hitler and would pose in his own handcrafted Nazi uniforms. After confessing to killing 11 people, including a Catholic priest with an axe, he declared, I shan't shed a tear. Life is full of shocks of all descriptions, and they have to be faced. The demons wanted my penis, wrote David Berkowitz. For the son of Sam murderer, sex was not something that involved a willing partner. Instead, his warped sexual fantasies, bred in social isolation, conjured up abstract forces of evil. We usually think of demons as pursuing loftier goals, such as souls, not a penis. But for the lust murderer, sexuality, power, and domination are intertwined so tightly they bleed into one another. It is difficult to tell where sexual lust leaves off and lust for blood takes over. The number of murders classified as unknown motives has risen dramatically. There are two types of sexual homicide. The rape or displaced anger murderer and the sadistic or lust murderer. How does a lust murderer differ from a rapist who kills his victims to keep from being caught? Rapists who kill rarely find any sexual satisfaction from the murder, nor do they perform post-mortem sexual acts. In contrast, the sadistic murderer kills as part of a ritualized sadistic fantasy. Mutilation is overkill, obsessively injuring the victim's body far beyond what is necessary to kill the victim. Because psychopaths have a low arousal rate it takes more to stimulate them. Macabre mutilations excite the lust murderer. For them, killing triggers a bizarre sexual fantasy which had developed in the dark recesses of their warped minds. Since his sexual history is that of solo sex and he finds interpersonal relationships difficult, if not impossible, he reverts to masturbatory acts even when a real partner is available. Masturbation generally occurs after death, when his fantasy is strongest. Because the fantasies do not involve an actual person but a symbolic, sacrificial victim, the violence can escalate after death. Mutilations often occur when the victim is already dead, a time when the killer has ultimate control over the victim. Many of the serial killers we have discussed admit to an abnormally strong sex drive. Ed Kemper, who would often behead his victims before raping them, said that he had, and I quote, a very strong sensual drive, a weird sexual drive that started early, a lot earlier than normal. If I killed them, you know, they couldn't reject me as a man. It was more or less making a doll out of a human being and carrying out my fantasies with a doll, a living human doll. The most disturbing thrill Kemper got from murder was the sexual excitement in decapitating his victims. I remember there was actually a sexual thrill. You hear that little pop and pull their heads off and hold their heads up by the hair. Whipping their heads off, their body sitting there. That'd get me off. Kemper went on to say, with a girl, there's a lot left in the girl's body without a head. Of course, the personality is gone. Those pesky personalities that serial killers find so troublesome in their victims explains why they go to such extreme lengths to depersonalize the bodies of their victims with horrifying mutilations. What is it about a personality that these killers find so threatening that they need to obliterate it? Before they begin killing, many serial killers display a fascination with death. This in itself is not unusual. Perhaps if their antisocial personalities had not gotten in the way, serial killers may have become doctors, scientists, morticians, or even artists. Gacy worked in a mortuary, sleeping in the embalming room, alone with corpses, but was fired after corpses were found partially undressed. Dennis Nilsson pretended he was a corpse and masturbated in the mirror to his own dead image. As a youngster Berkowitz became fascinated by the morbid. I always had a fetish for murder and death. Sudden death and bloodshed appealed to me. Jeffrey Dahmer, who loved the dissection in biology class, told a classmate that he sliced open the fish he caught because he wanted to see what it looks like inside. He liked to see how things work. He later gave the police the same excuse. He cut open his victims to see how they work. His attorney rationalized Jeffrey's cannibalism by declaring that he ate body parts so that these poor people he killed would become alive in him. Cannibalism is a literal form of internalization. Instead of making room in their hearts for the one they crave, the cannibal makes room in his stomach for the one they desire. The metaphorical hunger for another's companionship becomes a literal hunger.
Many describe it as a way to incorporate the other into oneself. Because psychopaths are incapable of experiencing empathy and love, this crude and primitive form of bonding becomes a sickening substitute. One particularly gruesome example of this notion of all-consuming love is Japanese cannibal Issei Sagawa, who killed and ate part of a Dutch student. He would lucidly recount how he coveted his victim. My passion is so great I want to possess her. I want to eat her. If I do she will be mine forever. Sagawa hesitates when he discovers her womb. If she had lived, she would have had a baby in this womb. The thought depresses me for a moment. But Sagawa continued on. The Martha Stewart of serial killers, Ed Gaines' gruesome home improvements featured lampshades made from human skin, seat covers, and skulls used for drinking cups. He also made clothing and bracelets out of body parts. Anatomical textbooks were not enough to satisfy his curiosity. He took to grave robbing and eventually murder. Are serial killers insane? Not by legal standards. The incidence of psychosis among murderers is no greater than the incidence of psychosis in the total population. The legal definition of insanity is based on the 19th century McNaughton rules. Does the offender understand the difference between right and wrong? If he flees or makes any attempt to hide the crime, then the offender is not insane because his actions show that he understood that what he was doing was wrong. Yet what person in their right mind would fillet young children and write letters to the parents, rhapsodizing over what a fine meal their child made? In the case of Albert Fish, the jury found him insane, but he deserved to die anyway. Only a few, including the dimwitted Ed Gain and sadistic Peter Sutcliffe, have successfully pleaded insanity. Always looking to manipulate, serial killers will do just about anything to convince the authorities of their insanity. Being declared legally insane means avoiding death row, and if the criminal can convince his keepers that he has fully recovered, there is the hope of actually being released. Acid bath murderer John Hay drank his own urine in front of a jury to convince them of his insanity, but only served to repulse them more. William Hickman was stupid enough to put in writing his intention to convince the jury he is crazy. I intend to throw a laughing, screaming, diving act before the prosecution finishes their case. He closes this letter to a fellow inmate with, P.S. You know and I know that I'm not insane however. One of the most predictable attempts to shift the blame is by creating an evil dark side or alter ego. Some of these creations are named as the true culprits of the crimes. While in custody, H. H. Holmes invented Edward Hatch, who he claimed was the shadowy mastermind behind the murder of the young Pizzle children. Lipstick killer William Herons created George Merman and actually corresponded with George by letters. John Wayne Gacy based his alter ego, Jack Hanley, on an actual cop by the same name. Gacy's Jack was tough, in control, and loathed homosexuality. When Gacy drank too much, the punishing hand of Jack would take control. One of the most notorious alter egos is hillside strangler Kenneth Bianchi's Steve Walker. Steve came out during hypnotic sessions as the aggressive opposite to Ken's gentle guy act. Clever hypnotists were able to snare Steve as a hoax. It was later revealed that Bianchi had seen the movie Sybil two days prior to his psychiatric evaluation. Fabricating an alter ego is a convenient way to pin the guilt on another, even if that other is within. It's a psychological variation of the devil made me do it. But diabolical alter egos are usually clumsy constructions that fall apart under scrutiny. At best, a legitimate split personality could hope for a mental institution instead of death row. But authentic cases are exceptionally rare. Most schizophrenics will resist the aggressive commands of the auditory hallucinations they hear. Santa Cruz in the 1970s had a renaissance of psychopathic killers. Of course, there is Edmund Kemper, the most articulate of the batch. His schizophrenic colleagues, however, are frightening examples of the truly mentally ill serial killer. Herbert Mullen heard his father's voice in his head, commanding, why won't you give me anything? Go kill somebody. Move. By killing people, Mullen was convinced he was actually preventing earthquakes and tidal waves. Unlike most serial killers, he was not seeking a certain type of victim. His 13 sacrificial victims included a family, a priest, a homeless man and some hapless campers. Upon his arrest, everyone agreed that Mullen was a paranoid schizophrenic, but was found legally sane. Unlike many serial killers who try to convince the authorities that they are crazy, Mullen tried to prove his sanity, stating that he was the victim of a huge conspiracy. He declared that he was a good American person who was tricked into committing the crimes. I know I deserve my freedom. 
On a self-described divine mission, John Lindley Frazier slaughtered a wealthy Santa Cruz family in 1970 because he believed they had been polluting and destroying the earth. Initially he was called an acid casualty, but later tests revealed Frazier as an acute paranoid schizophrenic. Nonetheless, Frazier was declared legally sane and sentenced to life imprisonment. David Berkowitz's Son of Sam routine was a well-constructed attempt to appear schizophrenic. There is no doubt in my mind that a demon has been living in me since birth, he raved. I want my soul back. I have the right to be human. Later he held a press conference, announcing that his story of demons had been an invention. Are the psychopathic criminals really different from birth? Many parents say that their children who grow up to be violent offenders are markedly different from their non-violent siblings. Three-year-old Ted Bundy sneaked into his teenage Aunt Julia's room one morning and slipped butcher knives under the covers of her bed. He just stood there and grinned. Serial killer Carl Panzram himself wrote. All of my family are as the average human beings are. They are honest and hard-working people. All except myself. I have been a human animal ever since I was born. When I was very young at five or six years of age, I was a thief and a liar and a mean despicable one at that. The older I got, the meaner I got. German child killer, Peter Curtin, had drowned two playmates by the tender age of nine. Are these children just born bad? The environment alone cannot explain deranged behavior. Too many abused and neglected children grow up to be law-abiding citizens. If there is a genetic explanation, it's a slippery, discreet mutation. We don't see entire families of serial killers. There is no such thing as a kill gene, but research is revealing some genetic tendencies to violent behavior. In other words, bad seeds blossom in bad environments. High testosterone in itself is not a dangerous thing, but when it is combined with low levels of serotonin, the results might be deadly. Testosterone is associated with the need for dominance. Many successful athletes and businessmen have high testosterone levels, but since not everyone can be the top dog, serotonin keeps the tension from peaking and mellows us out. When serotonin levels are abnormally low however, frustration can lead to aggressive, even sadistic behavior. This remains pure theory and was never proven, at least not on serial killers. However, it might explain some of the inexplicable surges of anger some subjects experience in some difficult situations. After I'm dead, they're going to open up my head and find that, just like we've been saying, a part of my brain is black and dry and dead," said Bobby Joe Long, who suffered a severe head injury after a motorcycle accident. According to many researchers, brain defects and injuries have been an important link to violent behavior. When the hypothalamus, the temporal lobe, or the limbic brain show damage, it may account for uncontrollable aggression. The hypothalamus regulates the hormonal system and emotions. The higher brain has limited control over the hypothalamus. Because of the physical closeness of sexual and aggressive centers within the hypothalamus, sexual instinct and violence become connected for lust murderers. The hypothalamus may be damaged through malnutrition or injury. The limbic brain is the part of the brain associated with emotion and motivation. When the limbic brain is damaged, the individual loses control over primary emotions, such as fear and rage. The predatory gaze of the psychopath lacks emotions and is as cold as a reptile's blank stare. Reptiles are missing the limbic part of their brain, where memories, emotions, socializing, and parental instincts reside. In other words, serial killers are aptly described as cold-blooded, just like their scaly reptilian brethren. The temporal lobe is highly susceptible to injury, located where the skull bone is thinnest. Blunt injuries, including falling on a hard surface, can easily damage this section of the brain, creating lesions, which cause forms of amnesia and epileptic seizures. Damage to the temporal lobe can result in hair-trigger violent reactions and increased aggressive responses. As a child, Ken Bianchi fell off of a jungle gym and landed on the back of his head. He soon began to have epileptic seizures. Some of these brain injuries are accidental, but many of them were inflicted during childhood beatings. Among the many serial killers who had suffered head injuries are Leonard Lake, David Berkowitz, Kenneth Bianchi, John Wayne Gacy, and Carl Panzram, who as a child, had some sort of head infection. Finally my head swelled up as big as a balloon. I was operated in our own home, on the kitchen table. I would sure like to know if this is the cause of my queer actions. Ted Bundy, however, had extensive x-rays and brain scans, which revealed no evidence of brain disease or trauma. 
Psychopaths have a greater fear threshold and are less likely to respond to fear-inducing stimuli, such as sudden loud noises. In other words, psychopaths may be immune to fear. The psychopath's heart rate and skin temperature are low, and their startle reaction is substantially less than the average person. The autonomic nervous system of intensely violent people is sluggish. They need a higher level of thriller stimulation in order to have an intense experience. These physiological characteristics, however, do not guarantee a serial killer. Many who are not violent have brain injuries and biological abnormalities. A lump on the head is no singular forecast for a serial killer. Can evil be reduced to a chemical equation? Perhaps it is a combination of environment and chemical predispositions. What we do know is that no singular pattern emerges for serial killers. Many of these biological studies are new, so perhaps in the future, the chemical profile of serial killers will be revealed. It's one thing to fantasize about killing someone, but it's another thing to do it. What prompts serial killers to cross the line again and again? Drugs are often involved, especially alcohol, as we see in the case of Gacy, Ramirez, Nilsson, and Dahmer. Stressors are events that trigger the killer into action. They can be a conflict with females, parental conflict, financial stress, marital problems, conflict with males, the birth of a child, physical injury, legal problems, and stress from a death. As the killer grapples with frustration, anger, and resentment, the fantasies of killing can eclipse reality. Many triggering factors center around some aspect of control. Gaines' mother's death sent him over the edge, while Kemper's fight with his mom made him crazed. Christopher Wilder, who traveled across the country, raping, torturing, and murdering eight women, claimed his murderous rampage began after his marriage proposal was rejected. When does a serial killer stop? Either when they are caught or killed. Very few have turned themselves in. Only Ed Kemper called the police to confess and waited at a phone booth to be picked up. A Humboldt County truck driver walked into a police station with a female breast in his pocket as proof of his deeds. Some plea to be caught, yet coyly disappear before the cops arrive to arrest them. William Herons wrote his memorable message. For heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. In bizarre, red lipstick cursive on the wall, while his victim lay dead, shot and stabbed in the neck. If there are any serial killers who quit because they were satiated or bored, we cannot know because they are not in captivity. Some claim that if they could, they would have indulged in mass destruction. The vampire of Dusseldorf Peter Curtin said the more people the better. Yes if I had the means of doing so, I would have killed whole masses of people. Brought about catastrophes. When Karl Panzram was infanticizing about poisoning towns with arsenic, he spent his time plotting a grand scheme to incite war between the British and the Americans. I believe the whole human race should be exterminated. I'll do my best to do it every chance I get, he told a jury before their deliberation. They sentenced him to death in less than a minute. Are there any reformed serial killers? Fortunately, our society is not willing to risk the opportunity to find out by releasing them. In fact, one of the most outspoken critics of reform is the serial killer who I just mentioned, the unrepentant Karl Panzram. I have no desire to reform myself. My only desire is to reform people who try to reform me. And I believe that the only way to reform people is to kill them. My motto is, rob them all, rape them all and kill them all. In the end, all we can conclude is that serial killers are human black holes. That they are so normal, so generic, so invisible, they terrify us because they mirror us. Henry Lee Lucas grimly proclaimed that all across the country, there's people just like me, who set out to destroy human life. Many of them describe themselves as having a piece missing, something dead within, or as Bundy said, a void inside. Not only are the victims a blank to the killer, as Lucas put it, but they are also blank to themselves. What I wanted to see was the death, and I wanted to see the triumph, the exultation over the death. In other words, I was winning over death. They were dead and I was alive. That was a victory in my case. Muse Dead Kemper. In other words, get a life becomes take a life. Killing others is not an attempt to fill the void, but to spread the void. To make the other into a lifeless object mimics the killer's own lifelessness. It didn't mean nothing. It just didn't mean nothing, said DeSalvo. It was so senseless that it makes sense. The serial killer lives on the other side of our social boundaries. He is an embodiment of the darkness, desire, and power that we must repress within ourselves. 
He is not a creature of reason, but of excess and transgression and voracious appetites. Selfish, carnal desire. He breaks the social rules that confine the rest of us. Our outrage keeps the boundaries intact, while our curiosity can explore the dark recesses of our own repressed desires from a safe distance.